morning, everybody. Right, so I'm going to talk about beta diversity and human impact from the point of view of soil biodiversity. This is quite cl classical community ecology, but at the end of the talk, I will talk also about some modern network theory. So I still remember the profound feeling of amazement I had the very first time uh, I was looking some years ago to my first sample of soil animal community coming out from really a handful of soil like the one you can have in a sample like this with an incredible number of individuals and many different species, fairly different in terms of key traits such as size or other traits that are clearly relevant to um, um, ecophysiology and, and traits important for the community assembly process. And all this was happening within this very small sample, all this diversity packed here, and what I can call uh, alpha diversity point. Um, so, um, and the diversity of such a soil sample is incredible. Because, for example, if you use molecular method to profile the microbial community, you end up very easily in hundreds of different species of bacteria and fungi, and you have several tens of uh, mites, culembulans, and nematodes. But eventually, when we are to study the overall diversity of a grassland or a forest, which is the gamma diversity of an area like these, we are to collect many more samples, and there, because of changes in species composition from one sample to another, which is called beta diversity, you're going to accumulate a very high diversity, and then you easily end up in hundreds of different species of fungi, or bacteria, maybe even thousands, and hundreds of mites, culembulans, and nematodes, without mentioning all the other taxa. So it's actually understanding the processes supporting beta diversity that will eventually allow us understanding the processes determining soil biodiversity, actually terrestrial diversity in general. So, um, so beta diversity is the connection between alpha and gamma. And I like here to cite the provocative book on the neutral theory of biodiversity in biogeography by Stephen Abel. 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago now, where he was saying that the science of biodiversity is not much farther along than medicine was in the Middle Ages. So cutting up and body to find out what organs are inside. And it's, this is calling up also sorry, scientists to see whether in these 10 years and more, we've been able to progress in this. And I think we, 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 we can say more than this, actually. Um, and the important point here of beta diversity with regard to terrestrial ecosystem and soil is actually that uh, beta diversity, that's very slow, you're right, Lim. is that for center, so beta diversity is definitely, so changes in species composition in space, definitely dependent on environmental heterogeneity, but maybe most importantly on habitat fragmentation and human activity because for centuries, the way we have been managing our land has been in the direction of creating very small bits of landscapes like uh, agricultural fields or copies, um, and even in this um, painting from the early Renaissance in Italy, you see that good government was equated with creating a highly ordered landscape consisting of different, very, very many small patches, which automatically imply we are creating what we call a meta, meta community scenarios with a lot of fragmentation and all those patches fairly isolated from each other. I'd like to notice here that there are even corridors. Now, if we are to conceptualize the soil assemblage as a meta community, the first thing we have to do is to define what the local community is. Very often for me, but also for my colloquial ecologists, this might be, for example, the rhizosphere of a single plant but it may be any unit you find suitable. So for example, the plot of your field experiment or any unit you think it's suitable to define a local community. 
eventually you have a collection of, of, of local communities or a set of different local communities with some isolation between them, and that's some inter-community. And there is a, a pool of species that each and every local community can sample from the, from the regional pool. And if the different species are diamond of different colors, then each local community can sample different species. And for example, if you have two local community dominated by the blue and the Bordeaux species, and here you have two other, in, at, the, at the bottom here, you have just two other local communities dominated by the black and the orange species, so this will be a gradient in community structure. Now, well, then the question is, what's the most, the simplest possible mechanism creating diversity when you have a major community? And the answer is actually coming from genetics. Uh, if we, from very basic genetic theory, if we equate the different species to the alleles of one gene, uh, then we have two possible very extreme uh, scenarios that saturate the two extremes of the gradients. We may have some good gene flow creating heterozygosity so that each local population has got some copies of different alleles. Or in a very extreme ideal case, we have no gene flow at all. And so we have the long-term drift and fixed section with each local population having only one allele. Um, and the uh, reality will be in the middle and we have many formulas that can quantify that diversity, the very famous F statistics, for example. Uh, but the point is that immigration is actually determining diversity. And the natural theory of biodiversity is just that, uh, where we have no gene flow, we have just immigration or no immigration, and no immigration would be complete fragmentation that in the long term would cause that the local community is dominated only by one species. Now, the point of this is that immigration is setting up well, the neutral theory of biodiversity comes with a rich set of predictions like species abundance distribution, species error relationship, and most importantly to, to me, beta diversity. Um, and the point is that immigration is setting up background level of diversity, and all the other forces and mechanisms you are really interested in are basically acting on top of that, um, so that we can use the neutral theory as a new model to test for the structure and forces we are really interested in, like Nietzsche's dynamics, environmental filtering, or disturbance. Um, so one of the problems we have when we, we look at beta diversity is that this has been a very, controversial, a very controversial topic in terms of the way we quantify beta diversity. It's a, a lively debated topic uh, but we can say there is directional turnover, which is the classical idea, and I, don't, I will not focus on this today. And then we have non-directional variation in community structure, which is the basic idea for which you take different samples from an area, there will be some changes in species composition, and you quantify that with some index, usually the classic uh, ecological distance uh, metrics you use, like Brecartis or things like that. So the idea here is that we focus on definitions of beta diversity that are based on the idea of variation in community structure in space, so you have your set of local communities, you have your ecological distance matrix, and from that, you end up in some average dissimilarity quantifying uh, the overall beta diversity in the area. When you use that, and you fit a neutral model to your data, the, the thing that is really controlling how much beta diversity you have, it's immigration, because immigration is a homogenizing force, so that if you have massive immigration, all the local communities will resemble each other. But it's not really important how much beta diversity, whether higher or lower. The important thing is that when you fit a neutral model, you have a quantitative prediction for the beta diversity of the major community. And this is the starting point of the, 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 the method I, I am using here, which is based on, on the following step. You take your community samples. You calculate your ecological distance matrix, you have some indices, and you quantify beta diversity, so you have observed beta diversity. At the same time, you have the species abundance distribution. You fit your neutral model, you end up in neutral parameters uh, estimates, and that will allow you to build a distribution of beta diversity value, assuming the community is neutral. It's not, but you assume that as a new model. And so you have a prediction for beta diversity. And then you compare observed and predicted. So the histograms is the distribution of beta diversity values from the neutral model. And you can observe that the real community has got much higher beta diversity than the neutral model. 
or it could be lower, like the black line here, or it could be that the real data are consistent with uh, the, the neutral model. I will first apply the model to two study cases and then try to show how we can understand these patterns. So for example, here we're supplying this to the Rebuddy My community, uh, uh, several communities uh, sampled under a range of conditions and disturbance regimes. For example, here you see a high intensity fire experiment where the real community has got much higher beta diversity than expected because the fire was creating a very, very patchy environment. Uh, but also in the Lampedusa Island, where the sampling regime was aiming at maximizing environmental heterogeneity, even also there we observe uh, very higher beta diversity with respect to very high beta diversity with respect to a neutral prediction. But there are also many instances where uh, the real community is consistent with a neutral model, like in this grass stand or in, in this grassland plot where you see that the real the, the observed beta diversity is falling just in the middle of the distribution distribution. So there's a range of patterns. Um, the same exercise on a community of arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi under a range of conditions and disturbance regimes. Here, I, I show the results in the form of a meta-analysis with the black vertical line being the neutral prediction for beta diversity and this being the, the real data. So when we have natural and relatively homogeneous areas, we observe that the real communities were having um, a beta diversity which was significantly lower than what's expected under neutrality. And when you have, we have heterogeneity and disturbance, we have um, very high beta diversity with respect to a neutral model. In, but in many cases, we also have communities consistent with expectation from neutral model for beta diversity. How do we understand that? Well, so when you have that the real community has higher beta diversity, like here, observed higher than predicted, there might be, for example, environmental filtering pushing the local community far away from each other because far away communities have to adapt to very, fairly different environmental conditions. Or it can be um, nature's divergence, which in principle is actually different from environmental filtering, although there can be an interaction between the two of them. And it can be a disturbance regime where communities that are under fairly different uh, disturbance level will tend to be very different in terms of community composition. Uh, on the other hand, you can have what I call convergence, which is the local communities resembling each other more than expected under neutrality, which is the classical expectation from uh, uh, Nash theory, where the assemblages are converging toward the ideal equilibrium assemblage expected under niche partitioning resource base, niche partitioning dynamics. Uh, but it could also be that some very strong disturbance, which I did not investigate, like TLH, can actually homogenize the community to the point of making everything equal because the community is basically dominated by the very opportunistic uh, species. We, of course, rely on experiments to shift from patterns to mechanisms, but of course, with this framework here, we have um, some strong quantitative prediction that we can test because it's basic, based basically on demographical uh, models. Now, there are challenges to, to be addressed. Uh, neutral theory, in the very strict, strict sense, is the counterpart of resource-based niche partitioning. So it should be, in the strictest sense, it should be applied within trophic levels, although competition can be mediated by predators. A classical example could be predator mites feeding on colambulans and colambulans competing for fungi, for example. And there it's quite important to measure other traits uh, like size, diet, also phylogeny, and practice to couple an analysis of the limiting similarity concept with an analysis of beta diversity. But then the main question is, is resource-based niche partitioning a main mechanism in soil community assembly dynamics? And in many cases, we know the answer actually is, is actually no. So, um, so then we have the necessity to go to a multitrophic extension of this, which is in any case necessary if we want to link the above ground and the, and the below ground. And this is a call to revise all existing food web models to make justice of soil biodiversity, because in the food web models we have, we're basically lumping all soil biodiversity into functional groups. 
And in practice, this is an assumption of neutrality within the functional groups, which is very true given the incredible level of diversity we observe within functional groups. Then we have two options. Either we accept the neutrality assumption and we exploit it to put diversity into food web models, or we reject the neutrality assumption and then we have got to model explicitly the diversity in, in, inside the functional groups. Um, one possible solution to that is in fact in network theory, especially the theory of dynamical, na uh, dynamical network of networks, which is the idea also sometimes network scientists call that cluster network or network with community structure, which is very true in the soil because the real food webs in the soil in practice very often can be defined at a, very, at a fairly small scale. Like each and every soil sample has got here a real food web. Uh, with an incredible number of species already interacting at that particular scale. And in principle, we can create a food web for each and every small sample or plot, whatever you like, but at a very small scale. Um, and then we need to link all those real networks uh, at the broader scale. So we need to, to do a scaling up exercise to link all those networks into the network which is connecting the local networks. And possible factors linking those could be uh, fungal life on network, the above ground grazer that are basically playing at a broad scale because they control plant population dynamics, uh, pathogens, roots. And there is where we can really, um, there is the, a, a component of being spatially explicit in a way, in the way we draw these food webs. And of course, the, the constraints of being spatially explicit and having this highly structured, having basically a network which is highly structured in terms of the local communities that make the network up, those constraints, constraints have profound implication in terms of the stability and resilience of the network in front of uh, perturbations. Uh, I wish to acknowledge some colleagues of mine and two sources of funding, DFG from Germany and European Commission for the Project Science, which just started. And uh, I will be happy to welcome your questions if you have. Thank you a lot, very much. Right, we've got time for a couple of questions. Can you see anybody? Okay, I'll, I'll ask you one then. Um, these beta diversity models, um, do these take into account both turnover and nestedness? Because those are the two elements of beta diversity. Uh, not nestedness. No. Uh, this, will be, this will be taken into account into the network extensions of it. Where, where, you know. When you do that? Yes. Yes, okay, that sounds good. Uh, 